All right, with no further uh, delay, I will turn the mic over to our illustrious presenters tonight, and we will begin with Kay. Thank you, Dee. Um, I'm Kay. I am a proud graduate of Cheney University. I graduated last year. Uh, I'm also a New York YCL member and a co-chair of the Queens Club uh, in New York of the CPUSA. Um, so today uh, we'll be presenting uh, this orb. Jafari, would you like to introduce yourself before we get started? Oh yeah, um, I'm Jafari. Um, I'm a New York YCL member. Um, I was also formerly in the Virginia YCL too. Cool. So with that, uh, we're going to be talking about the struggles of African American youth today. So the first thing I'd like to do um, is kind of concretize uh, the primary forces that African American youth are struggling against. Now, if you saw any of our promotional material, uh, you'll know that we were talking about right wing forces. Um, but that's kind of abstract, like what makes up the right wing um, and in what way are they a force? Uh, so when we talk about right wing forces, we're speaking specifically about the agenda of you know, big capital uh, that drives further exploitation of workers at all costs. Um, the lead implementers of this agenda don't care about preserving social peace. They don't care about the bounds of law. They don't care about considerations for any sort of democracy or even life. Uh, for them, the maximization of the reproduction of capital stands as uh, the sole end, regardless of any means used to split the working class to achieve it, uh, whether by racism, sexism, nationalism, chauvinism, transphobia, homophobia, or anti-communism. So unfortunately, many of our fellow workers misplace their own interests within this agenda. Um, that doesn't account for the lives or livelihoods uh, of them or their supposed enemies of a different race, sex, or what have you. So it's these forces uh, that are embodied uh, today by the Republican Party in a diverse coalition with many non-party elements that African-American youth find themselves struggling against in the last analysis. So we'll take a look at the many-sided manifestation of these forces and attempt to sketch a plan of continued resistance and pushback against them. Uh, so, oops, there we go. Uh, we can begin by looking at the unemployment rate for young adults, um, or I guess some uh, teenagers too. Um, here we have the unemployment rates of African American men uh, versus unemployment rates of uh, all men from ages 16 to 24. Um, so you can distinguish which one is which because the rate for African American men is consistently higher. And this has been for the past two years uh, since last January or since January 2020. Um, so this rate peaks at about 29.3% in June 2020. And we see um, at the same time, the rate for all men on average is 20.9 uh, at the same time uh, as that peak I just mentioned. And for women, uh, the same thing holds true. Uh, the larger unemployment rate is African-American women, uh, 16 to 24 again, um, throughout the entire time period that's shown here in this graph. Um, and also we see uh, peak employment of nearly one in three again. Now, uh, this data that was provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, reveals a telling pattern, even more than uh, what I just showed you, but it's kind of hard to show graphically. I'll tell you about it. Uh, after you filter the data to show only occupations where African Americans or women are overrepresented, uh, it becomes clear that in the majority of occupations where Black people are overrepresented, uh, women are also overrepresented, and the same vice versa. And roughly half the occupations where women are overrepresented black people are overrepresented. Um, so if you look at what these occupations are in particular, you'll see most of these jobs are in retail, in healthcare, in transportation, childcare, uh, and early education jobs. Um, so all these sectors 
uh, put African Americans and women, um, and of course African American women as a result of that, um, of all ages, but especially the youth, at the front lines during the early days of the pandemic. Uh, the lines of work mentioned above are also precisely uh, those lines of work that youth are most likely to be employed in. Um, and by youth, I mean those aged roughly between uh, 16 and 24. Um, and it's worth mentioning, uh, mentioning that uh, those mentioned um, or those numbers that I talked about before, they don't account for people who are, uh, say, marginally attached to the labor force. So people who have been discouraged and haven't uh, applied to work in uh, a large number of months, I think the range is about 12 months, um, or people who haven't applied at all who are not attached to the labor force uh, for a job. Um, so those people aren't counted. And you'll also see here uh, on the slide, uh, there's a high incarceration rate. Uh, African Americans are vastly overrepresented in the U.S. incarceration, uh, popu uh, the population of U.S. incarcerated individuals. Um, and there's little to no uh, reintegration process for those people who are caught up in that. Um, and those people aren't counted in these numbers either. Um, so the actual unemployment rate for um, African-American U.S. citizens uh, versus uh, everyone else is even higher than what I've shown here um, on the graph. And um, while there are some ways as individuals people can remedy this, for example, through education, uh, there is poor education for African-Americans. Um, so this leads to less access to uh, the resilient jobs that uh, might be available resilient in the sense that um, they are uh, not as um, they're not as able to be thrown out as say people are in, in retail um, or say in Amazon. Uh, so we can move on and talk about education. Um, so with so many roadblocks placed in the way, uh, getting an education is no easy feat for African-American youth. Uh, to start, though please, preschool enrollment is high among Black children um, at a rate of about 70%. Uh, the difference in quality can limit the benefits of enrollment uh, when compared to outcomes for children of other races. Uh, the gaps in school readiness between white and Black students in terms of like math, uh, reading, and behavior uh, has not improved at the same rate as the gap um, between white and Hispanic students, for example, or even rich and poor students. And as a matter of fact, uh, the rate of that gap closure between uh, white and black students um, uh, who are going into preschools is not statistically distinguishable from zero. Um, so as those students move into kindergarten, the math preparedness gap widens between white and black students. Um, so that suggests that there's inequality even as students are just now making it into school. Um, so as you go farther into uh, the educational pipeline, you see that uh, according to a study in the Economics of Education Review, uh, non-Black teachers were found to have lower expectations than Black teachers for the same set of Black students. Now, whether this is because Black teachers are overly optimistic or non-Black teachers are overly pessimistic, uh, is unclear in the study. But what is clear is that students pick up on these differences in expectations and they carry that with them in the classroom and when they go to their tutors or their parents um, or uh, their colleagues in class, um, that comes out in the way that they perform in class. Um, so as students continue to move on through education, as they go into higher education um, or become closer to it, uh, there's inequality in access to upper level classes, uh, for example, pre-AP and AP classes uh, might not be offered at some schools because they don't have the funding to uh, bring in the teachers or the students can't afford the tests um, or what have you. Uh, there's a difference in high school completion rates, right? So um, by the time that people uh, are getting their high school diplomas, there are less African American youth with high school diplomas than there are of other races. And this goes on to 
university. While the college enrollment rates are uh, fairly similar uh, across races, um, the quality of colleges that students attend is not equal across races. Uh, black students tend to end up in uh, worse colleges, um, worse in the sense of um, alumni earnings, and the college completion rates are not the same at all. Here I have pictured uh, Cheney University, um, a sign on its campus. Uh, Cheney is the first HBCU in the nation. Uh, it was founded 1837. Uh, a few students um, looked up the, uh, when I was a student there, we looked up the college completion rate for students at Cheney University and it was like 28%, 29% something very low like that. So when we look at, uh, you know, the uh, access to um, quality education, something that will be able to get you a job, be able to carry you through your life into your career, so you know, start a family based on that income that you're bringing in, um, it's not there for African-American youth far too often. For some it is, but um, some is not all, and it's far too few. Um, so on top of this, uh, all the while, there are right-wing forces that are trying to whitewash history um, in U.S. schools. Um, so students are lucky to learn that the uh, Civil War had to deal with um, fighting over human rights for Black people um, in the sense of people were literally owned. Um, and that's something that if you're a student, um, I've talked to students, uh, far too many of them who say, oh, we didn't know that uh, the Civil War was fought over slavery. We thought it was about states' rights. And you have to ask, well, states' rights to do what? Um, so that type of thing, um, or those types of things aren't covered in class. You can't um, learn about uh, some of these bills uh, are written in a way that you can't learn about um, what is called critical race theory, which is just um, code for these right-wing forces that I was talking about, these you know monopoly-backed uh, forces to say, well, you can't learn about the civil rights movement and you can't learn about the reconstruction and you can't learn about you know any of these things that really make up such a huge chunk of United States history. Um, and so uh, we can move on and talk about the health aspect. So when it comes to dealing with uh, COVID, I mean, we're still in the midst of this pandemic. Um, there have been inequities in uh, the environments that African Americans are living in uh, that lead to uh, an amplification of COVID's destruction in these communities. So um, I'll just use as a personal example, um, I was at Cheney University, I was still a student when the uh, pandemic reached the United States. And that school does not have a lot of students. It is um, critically underfunded by the state of Pennsylvania. It is a public university. Um, and so the university had to make decisions with regards to students housing about whether they were gonna have the school open and not have all the COVID measures that they um, that they maybe should uh, to minimize the amount of students getting sick, or to have the students close, or to have the university closed, and students would have trouble uh, accessing internet because a lot of those students at Cheney University come from Philadelphia, um, and they come from the lower income schools, and so with that there are questions around uh, people's ability to access the internet and thus access their classes and their study materials and things like that. Um, and what I just talked about is not a unique situation. Um, this was the case across many HBCUs, across many school districts in the nation. Um, and so we had to worry about, you know, if, if you live in a family of say five, six people, right? that don't have access to reliable housing, uh, access to that internet connection that they would need to go to these classes, access to 
um, time to, to go to the doctor and make sure that you're not getting sick and uh, that you have access to tests and vaccines and stuff like that, to good food, to make sure you can recover should you get the virus. All of these things were missing. So you couldn't get a hold of masks. There was a lower incidence of people being able to access masks within the African-American uh, youth. There is less access to testing. When the vaccines were made available, there was less access to those. Um, and there continues to be, right? Um, and with all the things in the world that's going on and all these pressures that are put on African-American youth, you have to think about their mental health, right? Um, the Congressional Black Caucus, I believe it was about three years ago now, uh, put together an emergency task force on black youth suicide and mental health um, that dealt with uh, the issue of suicide for black youth ages five to 17. And there's this myth uh, that I've heard propagated in my own life and that I'm sure many of you have as well, that um, black youth just aren't susceptible to suicide. That's like, a, I know I've been told this, um, by many people that this is sort of just a black thing or it's just a, a white thing or it's something that other people do. But when we look at the numbers, right, um, we see that the suicide rates uh, are increasing faster for black youth than for any other racial or ethnic group. Um, so this uh, task force had to bring together researchers um, and policymakers at federal, state and local levels to find out why is this the case, right? Of course, I'm going over a lot of these reasons why this is the case, but um, to come up with a sort of uh, comprehensive way of addressing these issues um, is something that's an open question, right? We're still dealing with these issues. Um, and you'll see more of the pressures as we go on in this presentation um, that cause uh, uh, great disparities in mental health uh, based on race. So there's also the HIV uh, AIDS pandemic. Um, uh, as it continues today, it occurs mostly among young black men. Um, if you look at the statistics, uh, you see that overall black people make up 13% of the population, but 42% of new HIV cases. Most of those are black men. Um, a good chunk of the rest of them are black women. Um, and so um, access to, um, again, it's like, it's like it just becomes this thing of all about access, right? How are you able to access health? Well, first you have to have health care, and these things are tied to unemployment, right? So on top of, you know, things that are just natural disparities that we can't really do much about, um, like, um, African Americans are more susceptible to, or they're not as good at uh, suppression of viruses, so they're more susceptible to HIV. There are things that we definitely can do things about, like providing better health care, um, that are just uh, not a reality for much of our Black youth. And so this turns up here, uh, dealing with Black men. I omitted from the slide that um, the incidence rate is highest among uh, gay Black men. Um, so that ties into uh, sexuality and gender, which I'll talk about soon. Um, and along with all of this, you have reproductive rights that are under threat, right? And um, I'm not sure if it's a majority at this point, but in a significant number of states, uh, there are there is legislation um, in state houses that is ready to pass should the Supreme Court uh, rule that Roe v. Wade is um, is invalid, and so uh, this is a significant threat, uh, which I'll talk about much more on the next slide, which has to do with sexuality and gender. But um, this is a health issue in more ways than one. It has to deal with physical health. It has to deal with mental health. It has to deal with health of our communities, uh, because the people who are tasked with uh, raising the next generation are more often than not uh, black women. 
whether that be through unpaid labor that isn't recorded in our statistics when it comes to the economy, or whether it is. Um, a lot of those occupations that I listed before on the unemployment slide had to deal with taking care of people's children in various ways or taking care um, of people's homes, right? And so uh, if reproductive rights are under threat, that really threatens the entire working class of the nation. Because if you omit the basic ability of people to decide how their how their bodies work, um, that just leads to such a breakdown of all the other rights that are built on top of that. Um, even within a capitalist context where you're dealing with um, women being tasked with uh, the main um, the main burden of reproducing the labor force. And so lastly on the slide, we have uh, socioeconomic status is tied to many, uh, many health indicators. So when you look at um, things like uh, rates of diabetes, rates of heart disease, rates of cancer, all these things are tied to socioeconomic status because the things you need to mitigate them um, are not publicly funded in many cases, or they're not regulated. Um, if they are publicly funded uh, so that they're a reasonable price for people. Um, and so all these diseases become very costly uh, to prevent or to treat uh, if prevention is not possible. So um, we can talk about sexuality and gender now. Um, I think it goes without saying, but about half of African Americans are women. Um, and about one in 20 African Americans consider themselves LGBTQ. Uh, and this number is greater uh, when you're considering the youth, right? And so when we talk about sexuality and gender, uh, the oppression takes on a form we call patriarchy, which basically discriminates uh, against individuals and communities uh, based on their gender and sexual identity. Um, so there are a number of ways this expresses itself, uh, one of which is a wage gap between women and men. Um, and I believe the rate um, is or was 82 cents on the dollar uh, for women in general, but for black women, uh, uh, when compared to white men, uh, earn uh, 66 cents on the dollar or 67 cents on the dollar, about two thirds um, on average. And uh, this wage gap closes a bit, uh, depending on if, say, the workforce is unionized where these uh, people are working. But, um, and we'll get into that as well uh, much later on in the presentation when we talk about things or ways to deal with uh, all these struggles. Um, but, uh, the gap persists, right? Um, we also know that Black women suffer from higher pregnancy-related mortality rates than other races. Um, the only other race that suffers similar rates are um, what are called in the statistics American Indians or Alaska Natives. Um, for youth, um, considering the ages from a little bit below 20, to up to uh, 30 years old. Uh, this ranges from 20 to 40 deaths, and it's a one-way increase. So the older uh, the women are, the more likely they are to have, um, to suffer uh, a death uh, during their pregnancy or related to their pregnancy. Um, and so this ties into, again, the reproductive rights that are being uh, revoked or under threat of being revoked, um, depending on the state. Uh, because um, abortion, which is the uh, question here, is, well, access to a safe abortion and an affordable abortion is crucial to preventing many of these uh, deaths. And it's just being yanked from under Black women. And Black women use abortions much more often than white women do. Um, and it's not a coincidence that these things are uh, being revoked at a time where the reproduction rate 
that's necessary to sustain the labor force, the number of people in the labor force at its current level um, is lower than a replacement, meaning that we're losing people from the labor force. Um, there are less people in the next generation that will be replacing workers from this one. Um, and so that legislation could be uh, viewed as corresponding with that, right? That's one angle you could uh, analyze these things from. And so um, on top of that, if you're considering uh, black transgender people, uh, they're at extreme risk in society of injury and death and you know, great suffering of different types. Uh, their unemployment rate is 26%, which is twice the rate of the overall transgender population and four times the rate of the general population at the time of this study. I believe it was pre-pandemic. Um, the homelessness rate was 41%, which is more than five times the rate of the general U.S. population. 34% uh, of Black transgender people make less than $10,000 annually. Um, and that is, let me see here, that's more than twice the rate for transgender people of all races and four times the rate for the general Black population and eight times the rate of the general US population. And the HIV rate is one in five for black transgender people, which is 10 times the rate of transgender people of all races um, and 40 times the rate of the general US population. And why is this the case? Because uh, a large proportion of the people who are affected are affected by uh, patriarchy, they're affected by misogyny, they're affected by racism, they're affected by homophobia. So all these things are simultaneously oppressing them. Um, and then on top of that, most of these people are working class. So they have to deal with the same things that um, at some level that um, the people who might be um, split and working against them uh, have to deal with. So, you know, um, this effort to split the working class along these different lines and have them fight against each other uh, really does no one any good. Um, and so I believe Jafari, this is you. Yep. Okay. So, um, thank you, Kay. I'm going to talk about mass incarceration. So in every state, um, black youth, they're more likely to be arrested than their white peers and five times more likely to be arrested on a national level. So, um, black people in general just face a differential, uh, treatment in the American justice system. So what they face are usually higher arrest rates, just like we just said earlier, um, longer bail, cash bail is a big problem when it comes to like black people in the justice system, harsher sentencing. We see so many um, cases in the media where someone like say Kyle Rittenhouse will murder somebody um, and get off scot-free while black people will be caught for some petty crime or something much less and then just go for a large amount of time away or even death. Um, but yeah, they get hard for sentencing in other races. And of course these problems apply to black people in general. Um, most of the stuff that we're talking about in the slides uh, apply to black people in general, but it applies specifically to black youth. Um, due to kind of inner city violence, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So at the current moment, um, the movements that are kind of leading the efforts in uh, being against mass things like mass incarceration, uh, obviously are Black Lives Matter. We all remember last year in the summer, the George Floyd riots, um, or the uprising rather, like Black Lives Matter, they were at the forefront of that and they were building the movement for a long time before that. Um, so we have to pretty much embed ourselves within these movements that are already at the forefront 
of the struggle. That's going to be um, a major repeated theme that I'll try to say throughout these slides and definitely at the conclusion. But in this case, it would be Black Lives Matter. But there's also other things we can do about mass incarceration. Um, something I didn't put on these slides, but I definitely should have, is uh, the Prison Abolition Committee run by mainly the New York YCL, but it's a national committee. Um, that's specifically an effort that we have here in the YCL that uh, they do a lot of prison letter writings. And a few months ago, there was a, um, if some of y'all remember, there was a kind of uh, session, I think Asha led it with um, Christian Jordan. Um, they just do stuff like that. So in terms of the struggle, what we basically need to do, I'll reemphasize, is embed ourselves in movements that are um, already fighting against mass incarceration, but we have to also contextualize it within the frameworks that we know, which is the struggle for socialism. Next slide. Okay, so I hinted at talking about this before. Um, inner city violence. So black youth, um, black people are in general just more concentrated probably in urban centers and black youth specifically are at a higher risk for exposure to physically harmful forms of violence at an early age. Um, that's the way that I put it there is not usually a way it's talked about. When we talk about gang violence, we usually talk about it as though it's just um, people that we kind of consider like adults or not children, kind of like just having violence against each other. But what we really need to think about is, well, from an early age, are they exposed to violence and why are they exposed to violence? So the effect of having this exposure, it has obviously negative results on the physical and mental health of black youth as they grow into adulthood. Um, so black youth are overwhelmingly the victims of gang violence. Um, black homicide rates for teens, they're over six times the rate for white teens and three times the rate for just people in general. Um, that's ridiculous, but once again, it comes, it all stems from a very deep, complicated problem of Black people's existence in this country since its inception, in, since its exception, inception, sorry, I can't say that. Um, so it's a manifestation of centuries of oppression, pretty much. If you, if you take a group of people and consider them objects for 300 or so years, and then after that, when you quote unquote free them, but then also create laws that stifle them at every, every, um, every corner, not allow them to buy houses, uh, always put them in the worst situations, ruin, ruin any movements that try to lead to their liberation, this is what's gonna happen. Pretty much um, black people are going to be at an early age exposed to violence and that violence is just gonna be a cycle of violence that definitely is something that's regressive for the black youth. So what we have to do is support movements for stopping gang violence. Um, we wanna have stable communities, stable black youth communities with nutritional food sources. This is something that uh, the Black Panther Party was really good at. They made sure that they had breakfast programs along with their political education um, programs too. And we have to kind of continue the legacy of doing that if we want to see gang violence be curbed or just eliminated altogether. Um, these communities need functioning roads. They need schools. They need hospitals that they're able to um have access to libraries youth centers this is it it starts within the community and if we're going to do anything about gang violence we have to go into these communities and support the efforts for um creating just a stable environment so that black youth have an opportunity outside of uh gangs all right next slide okay so voting rights um we were asked to make this kind of like a special focus of this uh, presentation. So <clears throat> voting is a pretty controversial thing when it comes to communist organizing. Uh, it, it's debated about a lot, but it is a field where millions of people are engaging and it's like the primary political process for the average person on the street. So if we wanna become a mass movement, we can't ignore voting, I'm sorry. Like it's another debate whether or not we should vote for this or that. But when it comes to voting rights, that's a part of the democratic struggle. So we don't have the luxury of ignoring that if we actually hope to be the actual vanguard of the proletariat. So from there, 
we should talk about how the black vote is under assault. Um, the black vote has been under assault, like I said, again, since the since the abolition of slavery. Um, black people didn't have the right to vote until civil rights, obviously. And now, these days, uh, it's under assault to the point where uh, it's the worst that's been seen pretty much since Jim Crow. So NYU's School of Law Brennan Center, they identified 19 states that passed 35 bills to restrict voting in 2021. Uh, that, that is just so absurd. Um, and then in the 2020 elections, 43% of eligible vac Black youth voted. That's, that's a large chunk um, of the Black youth. They care about politics. So if a large amount of Black youth are voting and there are these laws in 19 states that are restricting voting, which we always know these laws are racialized in the system, um, that means that we have to engage in this struggle in this specific context for Black youth. Another thing is that we have to kind of understand why they went to vote, like what were the most crucial issues in the 2020 national election. So during 2020, polls said that Black youth voters viewed COVID-19 and police violence as the most crucial issues they faced. Um, this is of no surprise, of course. The pandemic was super terrible for everybody. So, and it was very, very bad for the Black community as Kay, Kay pointed out earlier. Um, so of course that's gonna be on their mind. And also, like we said earlier, the George George Floyd uprisings, police violence was really at the forefront of like the political conscious of black youth. So if we once again want to, it's another thing whether we're talking about who to vote for or how to vote or this or that. If we're talking strictly about voting rights, um, we have to understand the issues that they care about and we have to protect their right to vote at the very least. All right, next slide. Okay, so overall, here are some actions that we can take that will kind of allow our praxis to serve the needs of Black youth. So the first thing that we can do is find and work with organizations that already struggle for the Black youth. There are organizations out there that are advanced and at the forefront of issues that Black youth face. And if we're ever going to be able to kind of embed ourselves into the community, solve issues like aid and support in like liberation for black people, the first place you should start are the people who are already doing things. So um, I, lift, I listed off some orgs that specifically are concerned with black youth. And then I also listed off some orgs that are just um, kind of black liberation in general. There's the Black Youth Project. Um, the I Project, the Equal Justice Initiative. There's of course Black Lives Matter, like I mentioned earlier. There's the uh, National Alliance Against Racism and Political Oppression. That's one specifically that uh, our party works with a lot. And National Black Justice Coalition. Um, I would go into these if I had time to. So another thing that we can do other than finding the organizations that are already out there at the forefront of the struggle is we can also host events ourselves. We can, we can use our resources to do like organizing to our capacity to do certain things that we know would be beneficial to black youth. So some of the things we could do is stop the violence rallies and campaigns in inner cities. Uh, we could have fundraisers to protect vulnerable youth, whether it be like LGBTQ or people who are at risk for homelessness. We could just like raise money to support these people, mutual aid, stuff like that. Um, awareness campaigns for victims of, I want to say, gender violence as well as police brutality, because um, th there's a lot of forms of violence against Black people, but those are two forms that are just very crucial to raise awareness for, like right? specifically like Black trans women. We we really need to protect them more. That that might sound silly, but um, we need to just raise awareness for making sure that these vulnerable people are pretty much secure. We can also have school and food drives, you know. Um, black youth, they, they need to stay in school, they need to get education as we talked about earlier, but they also need pencils, pens, dividers, stuff like that, backpacks. Um, these, are the, these are the things that will lead black youth to success and lead them less down the prison, the school to prison pipeline and more able to um, pretty much be educated. 
And we can also have food drives too. We need to we need to make sure that places that are food deserts or or places that are food insecure aren't food insecure anymore because it it all starts with nutrition at home. Like you you can't expect them to do well in school and to do good in community, et cetera, et cetera, if they just can't get their basic needs met. Um, COVID testing sites, as we said before, COVID affected the black community very hard. And just stuff like that. We can host our own events. Um, we can also aid in organizations that focus on uh, black liberation in general, not just, I guess, black youth, because the black youth are always going to be tied to the black population in general. So we can aid organizations that focus on anti-racism, mass incarceration, tenants rights, just things that are specifically, you know, affect black people. Another thing that we can do specifically is recruit for the Young Communist League, the YCL, as well as the CPUSA, but specifically the Young Communist League, because once again, this entire thing's talking about the black youth. Um, we need to go out into areas where they actually live. And, you know, we pretty much have to do recruitment. We have to pass out literature, talk to people about communism, convince them of the working class movement, talk to them about their issues, see what they care about. Um, once we actually get them in, we have to give them a nice socialist political education, organizing education, as well as doing political work, the work that we just talked about in the last few bullets. So basically just party recruitment and YCL recruitment is another thing that we can do, another action that we can take that will serve black groups. And specifically for voting rights, we can aid organizations like the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation that aim to increase the Black youth engagement in the democratic struggle through voting. Um, so if, if we have to specifically talk about voting rights, we should probably once again understand the organizations that work for Black people for voting. All right, next slide. Okay. So here's a conclusion. This is the application to our party and the struggle for socialism. So black people are triply oppressed. Um, Henry Winston, a uh, famous party member, party chair at one point actually said this. He said that they're under the threat of three things. They're under the threat of fascism, they're under the threat of racism, and they're under the threat of labor exploitation. And that that has been true forever. And it's definitely true these days with the um, rise of the fascist threat, of course, that came in the last couple of years. Uh, constant racism, of course, from just all forms, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. And labor exploitation, which is the primary struggle of all, of all class society, pretty much. So centering young Black people in our revolutionary practices, that's imperative for socialism because they're the next generation of the revolution. And since they're triply oppressed, because they're triply oppressed, they're going to be the people who are um, have the most drive in the fight. That's probably a bad way of saying it, but pretty much we have to center them. We have to center their needs because we're trying to liberate the people and they're a subsection of the people that are triply oppressed. So our movement has to serve as a vanguard and we have to attend to those needs. Um, like I said before, YCL Praxis, it has to center Black youth because the YCL is specifically um the youth kind of league of the communist party so this presentation all of this stuff applies greatly to the ycl um more so than the cpusa and all the districts out there they have to ensure that they're properly engaging in the all-sided battle for proletarian power which means that pretty much um this side is black youth so we, we, we can't just be like lopsided with one thing or another. Like we can't just pick one struggle and say like, that's our struggle. We have to, we have to uniformly be kind of the vanguard of plenty of struggles. So from this presentation, you know, we're focused on black youth, but at the end of the day, remember uh, the struggle for environmental rights is also the struggle for black youth, the struggle for LGBTQ rights are the struggle for black youth. Uh, workers' unions, all of those things affect Black youth because all of these things are connected in society because of dialectical materialism. Anyway, that's the conclusion to our presentation. The young Marxists have spoken. <laughs> Thank you very much.
We'd like to open the floor now for uh, comments and questions. And I'd like to suggest to Kay and Jafari that we take uh, several comments and questions and then I'll turn it back over to you and then we'll close out. Okay. All right, so if you'd like to make a comment or introduce a question, please click the picture of the hand on your control panel and we will scroll through and open your mic. Clicking the picture of the hand lets us know that you want to introduce a question or uh, make a comment and we will open your mic. Uh, Cameron, your mic is open. Open the, there you are. Hi, thank you, uh, Kay and Jafari for an excellent presentation. Um, I w um, earlier, the comment I wanted to say is earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, the high proportion of black youth in like um, low wage jobs like retail and fast food. Um, and I wanted to just mention like another struggle that I think is especially important for black youth is, you know, the fight for 15 in the union, which has been going on for, you know, 10 years. Um, you know, the fight to make these fast food jobs good jobs, um, I think it's really important too for you know, working class democratic movements and the fight against the extreme right. I would definitely characterize like the fast food industry as part of the extreme right, especially when you look at like the kind of um, ideology that they've promoted around work and especially as it relates to black youth who are um, working. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that that's another uh, movement that's been really important and continues to be really important. Um, and um, um, yeah, I think think enough, just something to hold up. One thing that, um, you know, no shade at all at the, you know, for instance, like the Starbucks workers who are working, who are organizing right now, like, I think it's a great thing, but I have definitely, I feel like I am noticing that like, it's gotten a lot more national attention recently than for instance, Chipotle workers organizing in New York um, for unions and the Fight for 15, which is also a national movement. and. Um, you know, partially maybe because it's it's um, national and also it's seen as being more spontaneous, and sometimes people think that that makes it more democratic. But um, but I, to me, there's like a little bit of um, implicit racism when 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 there's not also um, you know the the fight for 15 and and workers, you know, um, you know majority black and brown workers um, organizing um, are are overshadowed. Shadowed. Um, anyway, I I but I didn't know if it, Thank, thank you, Cameron. Thank you. All right, we'll take the looking for raised hands, looking for raised hands. If you'd like to introduce a question. Okay. Uh, Abin Nago, sorry, I butchered your name. You have to click the picture of the mic on your computer to open the mic on your, it, there you are. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You are completely fine about my name. Um, I was curious because growing up, um, I had experienced a lot of fascism and a lot of stuff in my youth. However, me coming from a background of being part white, part Romani, I can't really say that it's relating particularly to black struggle. However, one thing that really interested me and that was a big question for me was that the black people are triply oppressed and under the threat of fascism, racism, and labor exploitation. Um, a big, a big, uh, just shout out because you guys were amazing with your presentation. Um, I was completely curious that, uh, sorry, my question was completely scribbled out of my head. Um, how would a white person per se be able to uh, help in taking and combating uh, these types of, you know, exploitation and fascism and racism that is, you know, plaguing. Like, if we see it, uh, listen to our friends and peers, which is obvious, but, like, is there even more of a way we could ask, like, comrades, coworkers, like, of ways of helping, you know, deal with this type of, you know, segregation and help be able to fight that type of, you know, issue if it ever comes up? Okay, thank you. Let's take uh, a few more. Just, to, just, just maybe two more. Let's looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Please, if you have a question, please verbalize your question. 
we will not be able to read from the uh, to read from the uh, so looking for raised hands, looking for raised hands. Matthew, Charles, there you are. Yeah, um, just a question uh, for you, kind of two parts. Uh, what do you think are some of the obstacles as to why Black people are not more politically engaged in a, a Marxist framework? Um, and then also just in the country in general. So taking that same question and, and, and widening the scope beyond Black people. All right, let's take one, one more or you good. Let's take one more. Did we have any women? Let's see if I can find a woman. Well, Dante would kill me if I didn't. Dante, your mic is open. <laughs> I ain't gonna kill you, D. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just gonna throw this one out there because y'all need some more participation. So how do we make the, the Communist Party of the United States the party of the Negro people once again? Okay, Dante. You should, you, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to play too much. All right, let's stop. But that's a good question for Dante to ponder. All right, so I'll turn the floor back over to Jafari and Kick. Kay, do you want to start with any of those questions? Sure. Um, I'll talk about how uh, white people can help black comrades fight fascism. Um, I spent a good portion of my time growing up in Texas. And so there's a high concentration of white people and Hispanic people, especially for Mexico. I mean, Texas is basically Mexico, isn't it? Um, I wish I had more people like my math teacher in high school who, uh, so the, there's an educational, uh, the attitudinal thing that I was talking about between uh, uh, black students and, uh, or black teachers and non-black teachers uh, is a real contrast. And when a teacher sticks out their neck for you and makes sure you know that uh, you're appreciated and they want to see you do good work and that whenever you um, fall on something that they're going to be able to help you back up and make sense of what's going on um there's that kind of camaraderie that would be appreciated there's also the kind of camaraderie that we saw with the george floyd protests um we saw people forming defensive lines, white people forming defensive lines in front of their black comrades out at protests. And that type of thing isn't just something you can do at a protest. It's something that you can do at any time in your life. If you see your black comrades are having trouble dealing with someone's racism or something like that, you can speak up on their behalf if you've cleared it with them, right? make sure to, to make sure that you're doing it properly. Um, you can make sure that black people, if you're like you're an educator or something, you can make sure that black people have access to a good education to the degree that you're able. I know I had um, an unnamed professor uh, at Cheney who was kind of an example of that. The reason I have the job that I do now is because that professor was there to make sure that the students who are taking his classes um, at the school had access to a good education. He left a good job to come to Cheney. Um, so things like that um, are ways that white comrades can help black comrades combat racism um, and fascism. And please talk to your people. 
talk to your people, make them understand that all this nonsense about black people are this, black people are that, they're lazy, they don't know how to, all that stuff needs to go. You can't have that and build a working class movement. So if you have to bring them around the back door through some other issue to get them to understand, oh, look, when you're racist, it helps no one, then do that. You don't have to confront them head on if, you, if it doesn't work. But there's always a way, well, I won't say always, there is more often than you would think a way to bring people into the struggle. You just have to look for it, be a little bit creative. That's what I have for that. Just and um, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about the uh, question of what are some obstacles to um, black people entering like the communist movement, I guess. Um, well, there are a lot of reasons, you know, there's, uh, there's the obvious reasons in general uh, why people just beyond black people aren't communists and a large part of that's the Cold War. But if we're gonna talk about like specific reasons for black people, um, I think it just goes back to the triple oppression and like the um, economic burden that black people have to face throughout their life. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but I, I see that as like a primary reason. Um, if you're if you're if you're at a low rung in society and um, you're struggling to make ends meet or you're not even making ends to meet and you're constantly being harassed by the police, et cetera, et cetera, the things that black people face, that makes it all the harder for them to uh, have like a raised class consciousness in a way that they would join the communist party. Like they, they would have, they would be like partially class conscious because there's just class consciousness that comes within uh, working in the capitalist mode of production because within the capitalist mode of production, there's seeds of socialism. So we become conscious just by, you know, the ever increasing uh, socialized, socialized part of labor. That that that's part of Marxism that I'm trying to say. But um, to understand all that, you know, you kind of either have to have a force telling you, which is what our job is, to go into the communities and introduce them to them, or you have to come to it on your own. It's good. It's really hard to come to it on your own when you're struggling in a society that's just pretty much against you. So um, I hope that answered that question. I think the biggest roadblock to Black people being communist is literally just struggling to survive, among other roadblocks. OK, uh, are, are, are there any other closing remarks that you all would like to uh, make? Sure. Um, I'll tag on to that. Um, and this kind of takes care of the, the comment um, about unionizing and the fight for 15, um, particularly at Chipotle, but in general, uh, the fast food industry and things like that. Um, and also addresses the point about how do we make the CPU say the party of the Negro. Um, we have to go out there and actually do it, right? We can uh, sit amongst ourselves and uh, talk about theory, and that's great, especially in this period of growth for our party. We have a lot of people who are coming from different parts of the movement, um, the working class movement, and they might not be up to speed on all the things that has happened in the past you know, five centuries or so. But um, that's great. But once that's done, or as we're doing that, in order to sharpen all these things, we have to go out and practice what we're talking about. So when we say, how can we make CPU say the party of the Negro? And why aren't black people engaged in a Marxist framework? Well, there's the anti-communism aspect. Um, but you also have to consider there are people who are raised to think that, you know, I know religion was a big part of my upbringing and it's a big part of the black community. If you're raised to think that Marx is an evil uh, person who wants to steal your stuff um, or wants to steal your religion or Marx is just, you know, an old dead white guy who had nothing good to say about anyone, um, that's going to affect things. And the way you counteract that is by actually going out and illustrating to people through theory and action that when, for example, they're giving out food, 
um, at a church to the community, to people who are homeless and things like that on a consistent basis. They're part of the working class movement, right? That if they're going to a historically black college or university and they're educating black students and making sure that they have access to um, the education they need to go out and help their communities and build out infrastructure and things like that. You're part of the working class movement. If you're a student at an HBCU and you're starting up new student groups to increase that democratic participation of the student um, body and you're trying to get um, access to food, access to good housing and things like that on your campus, you're a part of the working class movement. Right. And once you illustrate that to people in one area, it becomes much easier to connect it to other things. And that's how you make CPUSA the party of the Negro. That's how you make it the party of women. That's how you make it the party of Native Americans. That's how you make it the party of all of these oppressed groups, especially oppressed or, you know, just workers. Everything we see around us is built by workers. And if you can show that when people are fighting for self-preservation, they're a part of the working class movement. And when they're fighting with others, that they're helping build it. Um, that's how you build the party. That's how you build towards these things like five for 15. That's how you, you know, unionize the workplace. And that's all. Jafari, did you have anything else you wanted to say? I co-signed that. That's, that's, I, I like it. Let's end with that pretty much. Well, I'll tell you, I, I co-signed it too. So K, and Jafari, thank you very much. Good night. Thanks for thanks for coming, guys. Good night. Yes, thanks for having us.